All right, good afternoon. Uh, ahead of UN Day, which is, as you know, on October 24th, there we go, uh, the Secretary General is speaking uh, just about now at a virtual event in the General Assembly Hall. A recorded performance featuring the Teatro de la Scala's orchestra and the special guest Roberto Bole, along with other world-class dancers, is being shown. In his remarks, the Secretary General will emphasize the importance of culture in the work of the United Nations. He will say that he hopes that today's concert will inspire us towards the global solidarity that is needed so urgently at this unprecedented time. He will also reinforce his appeal for a global ceasefire so we can devote all our energies on fighting COVID. And uh, this morning, he also spoke by video message to the virtual global education meeting organized by the UN Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization and co-hosted by the governments of Ghana, Norway, and the United Kingdom. The Secretary General noted that his recently issued policy briefs of the impacts of COVID-19 on education, he warned that the world was at a risk of a generational catastrophe. He pointed out that the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable and marginalized children and youth. The Secretary General emphasized that we now need to support the learning recovery in low- and middle-income countries and to factor education into every stimulus package. Also, through a video message, the Deputy Secretary General, Mina Mohammed, stressed that education in the docking station, excuse me, stressed that education is the docking station for all the sustainable development goals and that delivering the SDG4 is a great responsibility on us all, led by the education community. And here, the, Sec the Security Council is meeting in person on Sudan and South Sudan. Briefing council members is the Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, Parfait Onanga Anyanga. He noted that the preventive measures applied by the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, otherwise known as EGAD, appear to have been successful in weakening the spread of COVID-19 in the region. He added that the focus has shifted to economic recovery and restoring people's livelihood. Mr. Onanga Nyanga said he is happy to report that the relationship between Sudan and South Sudan continues to strengthen. Also addressing the Council was Jean-Pierre Lacroix, the head of UN Peace Operations for the UN. He noted that the peace process has made little progress in Abye. He noted that the gen he said the general security situation in Abye remained rather volatile, including attacks against UN personnel and instances of intercommunal violence, including armed attacks on villages. We've shared both those remarks with you. <clears throat> and the World Health Organization today said that the rollout of newly approved antigen-based rapid diagnostic tests for COVID-19 in Africa will significantly boost testing capacity and make, a game, make it a game changer in the continent's fight against the virus. According to WHO, many African countries have struggled to test in sufficient numbers to control the pandemic. The new rapid tests are easy to use, cheaper than PCR, and provide the results in just 15 to 30 minutes, enabling countries to decentralize testing. Globally, 120 million of these tests are being made available to low- and middle-income countries through the ACT Accelerator, a coalition launched by WHO and its partners, comprising of international organizations, the private sector, philanthropists. Uh, it aims to expedite the development, production, and availability of promising tests, vaccines, and treatments for COVID-19. WHO said that rapid antigen tests are in, addition, are in addition to PCR tests, not a replacement. And uh, staying on the um, topic of COVID-19, I want to give you an update on what our country teams are doing on the ground, this time looking at Colombia, where the UN resident coordinator there, Jessica Faeta, is leading our team's work to support national and local efforts to save lives and livelihoods in coordination with the UN's verification mission on the peace and security front. Through the Health for Peace Project, the World Health Organization, the International Organization for Migration, the UN Population Fund are all boosting access to health services in conflict-impacted municipalities. The UN team is also working on the pandemic response plan for the Amazon region uh, in cooperation with our teams in Brazil and Peru. As a result, the UN Children's Fund provided hygiene kits and risk communication support while the World Food Program increased food distribution. The UN in Colombia is also providing food, sanitation, and shelter to more than 900,000 people while supplying protective equipment, including 15,000 masks, 
uh, produced by former FARC combatants, and these were given to indigenous communities. We also secured more than $50 million to support socioeconomic recovery plan. A UN impact assessment showed that Colombia's economy contracted nearly 16% in the second quarter, and un unemployment reached nearly 17% in August. And um, as we told you earlier this week, today the UN Refugee Agency is co-hosting, along with the US, the United Kingdom, and the European Union, a virtual donor conference to help the Rohingyas both inside and outside of Myanmar. Speaking at the event, the Emergency Relief Coordinator, Mark Lokok, said today's conference sends a message to the Rohingya, the world's largest stateless community, and to the generous host communities that the world has not forgotten them. He noted the UN, along with our partners, have continued to support more than a million Rohingya refugees and their host communities in Bangladesh. Mr. Lokok added that the Rohingya refugees themselves have been the backbone of the response to COVID-19 in Cox's Bazar and stressed there are still more than 600,000 Rohingyas inside Myanmar. Those people continue to have their basic rights denied. They suffer extreme hardship in Rakhine State and elsewhere. Basta. Toby and then James. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks very much, Steph. My question is about the unrest in Nigeria. We saw uh, a, a counterpart to that unrest here actually at uh, UN headquarters. And I'm wondering what the Secretary General uh, feels is, um, is the, the root of the sentiment behind this uh, this unrest and what is to be done about it. Thank you. I mean, I think the, the Secretary General has been, uh, we've been very, very clear uh, that we have called uh, for, um, for the demonstrations to be peaceful. Uh, we have called on security forces to show uh, restraint. And we've said to the government, we're willing to accompany them as uh, they deal with issues of uh, police reform. Uh, and other issues, uh, and that those who are responsible for abuses, for rights violations, need to be uh, held accountable. Mr. Bayes. Yeah, can I ask you about um, leadership in, the, uh, in, in parts of the UN system? Um, does the Secretary General have full confidence in the Secretary General of ICAO, Fan Lu, Lu, Lu um, and that she is working in the interests of uh, her organization not in the interests of China. Let me just put it this way. Uh, it, it, the head of ICAO is, um, is elected by its member states. Mm -hmm. The Secretary General has no authority over ICAO or how its leadership is chosen. So it is not for the Secretary General to express confidence or no confidence in the leadership of a, uh, of a, uh, of a specialized Agency, so I, I don't, you know, I'm. He has no but, problem with her work, though. But it, you know, and, and ICAO is, is a member of the of of the um, uh, of uh, of the United Nations family. The Secretary General works well uh, with ICAO and its and its leadership. Uh, but the leadership of ICAO, the International Postal Union, uh, WHO, uh, the International Intellectual Property. Or well, let me is, ask is, another. Is, is, is all that those, those lead? No, but let me ask those leaders are always accountable uh, to their uh, governing bodies. Does he also then give you another example? The International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, um, Hu Xin Zhao, does he, does he believe that um, Mr. Zhao is doing a good job and working in the interests of the international community has, and not in the interests of China? The, the Secretary General has uh, no, no doubt that uh, the leadership of all of the UN specialized agencies are working with the best interest of the United Nations because at the heart. Uh, and and I, I, I know where, I mean, I, I'm sure we've, we've all read the same, uh, yeah. uh, same op-ed. Um, but again, these leaders, as opposed to leaders of uh, funds and programs who may be appointed by the Secretary General, these leaders are accountable to their governing bodies, but the Secretary General has no issue with any of them. So uh, you're aware that the op-ed was written by uh, Ambassador Kraft of the United States. She's making allegations against those two individuals in particular, that they've been, in one case, covering up Chinese hacking, in another case, actively promoting Huawei. Um, 
does he think it's appropriate for the U.S. ambassador to be making such personal attacks on leaders in the U.N. system, and does he plan to talk to the U.S. ambassador about this? The, every, everyone is free to express themselves. Uh, it is not for the Secretary General to judge on the appropriateness or the non-appropriateness of any, uh, any statement made uh, by, a, um, uh, by a permanent uh, representative. Secretary General's door is always open, and uh, literally these days, uh, literally open, because we try to keep that room well ventilated, uh, for any permanent representative who wants to speak to him. Okay. Uh, um, uh, hold on a second. Let me, um, I'm having problems. Uh, uh, um, Sylviane, please, sorry, go ahead. Thank you, Stefan. Do you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is any reaction uh, on the official reaction from the SG on the selection of uh, Mr. Saad Haridi as a new head, head of the Lebanese government? Look, I, I would refer you I to... another question. Yes, I would refer. I yes, I would refer you to uh, what Mr. Kubish, I think, said publicly uh, just a few hours ago, uh, encouraging uh, Lebanon to have a, a, a pro-reform, uh, effective uh, government. Uh, the other question is uh, the consultation on the consultation of the fifteen fifty nine report that will take place next Wednesday at the United uh, Security Council. Who will be briefing uh, this uh, event, this consultation? Uh, if I'm is not... It, uh, Under Secretary Ambassador Rosemary Di Carlo or Ryan Kubish? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that briefing is usually done by either the head of the Department of Political Affairs or uh, one of her representatives. But we, we can double-check. Is it... Uh, is it a duel between Beirut and the United is there, States? Is there what? A duel? Or? Is it going to be dual? Yeah. In, uh, in I, I don't know. We'll check who's Lebanon. brief. We'll, we'll, I, there, there is no duel between Mr. Kubish and Ms. Rosemary De Carlo, but we will see uh, who is. We will see who's briefing. Um, uh, okay, thank you. Abdel Hamid. And both foreign ministers of Azerbaijan and Armenia will be in D.C., I think, this weekend. Mm -hmm. Is the Secretary John planning to meet with uh, both or with either or with one? No, he's been in touch, as, as you know, he's been in touch with their... If you could mute your microphone, there we go. Uh, he, as you know, he's been in touch with both uh, foreign ministers uh, over the different times during this, uh, this, this crisis. Um, Washington, uh, the U.S. is one of the minced uh, co-chairs, along with the, the Russian Federation uh, and France. So we support, obviously, all these diplomatic efforts that could de-escalate uh, tensions and return to negotiations under the auspices of the co-chairs. Okay? Uh, unless I see somebody waving their hands wildly in the air, either on screen or in person. I will turn over this august podium to Mr. Varma.